So thank you all for, for coming out uh, this evening. Um, I think it'll be an interesting discussion. Um, how many of you have actually had acupuncture? Okay. <laughs> and how many of you actually understand what happened when you had acupuncture? Yeah, that's the, exactly, that's the, the thing. So this talk is basically, you know, acupuncture 101. So the goal is basically just to give you an overview um, you know, who's practicing this medicine, um, a little bit about the conditions that can be helped, and in introduce the basic concepts of traditional Chinese medicine. Um, so the philosophies, theories, um, some of the terminology, um, and, and really um, so that it gives you an appreciation of the complexity of this medicine. Um, when you get acupuncture, I'm sure whoever has given you the acupuncture, they don't tend to say a lot. They might say things like, oh, we're balancing, you know, your digestive system or we're moving your chi and uh, just very kind of vague uh, terminology. And there's a reason for that because this this stuff is really confusing and we, and we don't want to mislead you. Um, so today is about delving into all of that stuff and really giving you an exposure to the real stuff, you know, peeking into the mind of your acupuncturist. So finally, uh, you know, I'll give you some examples of the diagnosis and treatments, and then the role that acupuncture can play in, in, in an integrative model of care. And of course, that's been happening um, at the Kaplan Center for over for 25 years. Um, but the, the rest of the US medical system is starting to catch on to this. So here's a history of Chinese medicine in, in one slide. Um, <laughs> It, the, uh, the first acupuncture needles were dated to back to um, 1000 BC, um, so that's over 3000 years of this history, um, which I'm not going to get into too much detail uh, right now. Um, but uh, kind of the, the big moments are um, about 100 B BC, uh, the Huang Di Neijing, which is the um, emperor's uh, uh, the Yellow Emperor's Inner Classic is was written, and um, and that is actually still the the, the basic uh, f the fundamental text that's used in Chinese medicine, still relevant today. Um, and the you know as far as the United States, um, the kind of the big um, uh, introduction to um, acupuncture in the in the U.S. was uh, James Reston, who was a New York Times reporter, um, who had acupuncture in China when um, he uh, was reporting or he was following Richard Nixon, um, and had you know an appendectomy and um, subsequently had acupuncture and and you know, and why wouldn't he write about it <laughs> in the paper? And um, after that is when um, the school started to become established in the 70s. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that definitely put the acupuncture on the map was um, in 99 when there was a, uh, the National Institutes of Health did a um, consensus statement or consensus conference uh, which reviewed all of the research and literature um, on acupuncture. And this, uh, this list is actually from the World Health Organization, um, and I have that in your um, packet. Of all the conditions that r the research has shown for that acupuncture is helpful, um, and you know, at this point we know that um, pain is managed really well by acupuncture, a whole variety of different things. Um, and, uh, and you can review this list. There's, you know, more and more research is uh, happening every year um, showing its benefits. So styles of acupuncture. <laughs> There's pretty much as many styles of acupuncture as there are acupuncturists. Um, but these are some of the major schools and theories. And um, today, you know, what I'm gonna be talking about is traditional Chinese medicine, which is, which is one school um, and um, but just know that there's many other ways of the diagnosis is, is being done. So the who who am I, right? A, a licensed acupuncturist. Um, what does that entail? What is the training involved? Um, the licensure varies by state, but most states require board certification um, in acupuncture. In 2012, a survey showed about 30,000 licensed acupuncturists in the country. Of, 
very large portion, 37% of that is are in California. Um, the rest are mostly in these states, Colorado, Washington, New York, Maryland, Massachusetts, and New Jersey, which is um, not surprisingly where some of the major schools are. Um, and uh, in this survey, there was 544 in the entire state of Virginia. And the national boards um, for licensed acupuncture is done by the NCCAOM. Um, and a, a diplomat of acupuncture has to have um, an, a three to four year master's degree uh, program, about 700 hours in Chinese medicine and acupuncture theory, of which I tried to cram most of it into the rest of these slides for tonight. There, uh, 500 hours in, um, in sciences, so you know, there's a, a big element of knowing when to refer out um, to other practitioners, to physicians. And then, um, and then some other pieces as well. For a diplomat of oriental medicine, which is the certification that I have, there's an additional 450 hours in Chinese herbal studies, so I do acupuncture as well as uh, herbal medicine physicians because they have the background in um, anatomy and, um, and, uh, and medicine. Um, in order to, to uh, be able to do acupuncture, they need about two to 300 hours, depending on the state of acupuncture education and training. And the board certification for physicians is called the American Board of Medical Acupuncture. So some of the major principles that uh, of Chinese medicine is the holistic concept. The body is one unit. You can't really break it down into specific, you know, systems. And going beyond that, that the body and nature are one unit. That we can't be separated from our surroundings. So, um, you know, coming here from from Seattle, the uh, treatments, the symptoms that I'm getting, that I'm seeing are actually a little bit different. Um, and because of the climate difference, th there is a, a difference in how I'm going to be um, doing treatment plans as well. Um, in addition to that, uh, you know, the seasons affect um, treatments, you know, where each individual resides. This is all a part of our, our makeup, and this is a, a big part of Chinese medicine. There's a <coughs> Um, an overall analysis of signs and symptoms. So, you know, when you come to see me, I'm going to be um, observing, you know, how you walk down the hall. What is your the coloring of your face? Um, w we have this term called the shen, which is the vi the vitality. You know, do you have that that spark in your eyes, or are you just is there a dull look? Um, there's a lot of observation involved. Also, listening, you know, the sound of your voice, your breathing patterns. Um, smelling is not something that I um, have been thoroughly trained in, but there are some practitioners that just by smelling, um, you know, the, their uh, patients um, can tell a lot about their patterns um, of, uh, of illness. Um, so inquiring, getting, you know, the basic medical information, um, medical uh, history um, and family history, and then um, feeling is a, a big part of it. So, you know, palpating, palpating the tissue, getting a feel for, um, you know, any swelling or uh, toughness of skin, you know, um, if, if, uh, if there's heat or cold, uh, you know, involvement. Um, these, this is all part of the, the overall picture. And then this idea of having um, diseases and, and syndromes. So I'm gonna be refer referring as diseases as Western diagnoses. Um, and syndromes as the Chinese medicine diagnoses. So one disease can have multiple syndromes, one syndrome can manifest as multiple diseases. And, um, and these are examples of that. So in the case of um, hypothyroidism, so that's one disease that is characterized you know, by thinning hair, dry skin, um, a feeling of cold, sluggishness, um, there can be um, depression or memory issues. And from a standpoint of, of Chinese medicine, that can actually occur in um, six different um, syndromes. And, um, and you can see we have three, two of them are spleen, three are kidney, and one is heart. And, um, and if you take one of those, which is uh, spleen yang deficiency, um, spleen yang deficiency 
is this is it's characterized by cold extremities, which is very much in line with hypothyroid, um, excess weight. There's also an element of um, digestion, so loose stool, um, some edema, cramping. Um, there's poor appetite um, and fatigue. So somebody who's spleen yang deficient is not necessarily going to present with um, hypothyroid and, and or you know uh, have the blood tests for that. But what they can have is other um, diseases, including IBS, depression, obesity. They can have chronic fatigue syndrome um, and or infertility. So tongue diagnosis. I, I wanted to include this because this is one of the things I, I get asked questions about all the time is, you know, you're sitting and you're having this nice conversation and then I say, will you stick out your tongue at me? <laughs> and it's varied responses. Um, so what am I looking at when I ask you to stick your tongue out at me? I feel like I should do that right now just to, to see your tongues. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm looking at the tongue, the, the color of the tongue body. I'm looking at the the coating, um, is there a, t a red tip at the end? So um, if there's uh, a red uh, tip can actually be sleep issues. Um, paleness can be fatigue. Um, a coating can be digestive issues. So there's all of these um, different um, the components that match up with these syndromes based on the tongue and, and also um, pulse. So um, the Pulse can, can show a lot about what's going on inside the body. Um, I'm not just looking at um, the rate of the pulse, but also um, the quality of it. How deep is it in, inside the body? Do I have to push really hard to find it? Um, is it? Is it tight? Is it wiry? Or is it kind of flowing? There's all these different descriptions of, um, there's about, I think over, over about 28 different types of pulses. Um, that all give more information.